Austin, you can start. Perfect, thank you for me. Well, uh, I wanna uh, welcome everybody and, and good morning to uh, many of you and good afternoon to others and, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Austin Blackwell and I'm the Director of Marketing for Botox Urology at Allergan. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joining uh, all of you for, for today's kickoff to uh, the, the AUGS APP meeting and, and the program we're gonna, we're gonna have the opportunity to go through together in just a few moments. But first of all, I wanted to thank all of you and extend gratitude on behalf of Allergan, which as of just a couple of weeks ago now, uh, is now an AbbVie company, which we're very excited about uh, and taking the time to dial into today's meeting, which is, is gonna be kicked off by this educational session with Andrea Barker, who I have the pleasure of, of introducing uh, today. Um, sort of a new way that we're connecting this year. I know some of you, we were able to meet um, last year. Allergan did support the AUGS APP meeting last year. We, we certainly uh, value our partnership with the AUGS Society. Um, and for those of you that we haven't met before, um, it's great to, to, to meet you over the web uh, and look forward to uh, connecting uh, in person in the future. So I also just want to acknowledge for, that our thanks to you as, as healthcare providers and the sacrifices that all of you make every day to risking your own health uh, to, to better the health of others, given the, the current environment and situation that we're in, uh, that has sort of led us to uh, connect uh, over, over the web for, for this year's meeting. So um, I have the distinct pleasure uh, to introduce today's presenter, which is Andrea Barker. Andrea is a physician assistant at Princeton Urogynecology uh, in New Jersey, where she's practiced for about 10 years now. Um, their practice is a, has a true pelvic floor center um, that is very focused on the patient experience and I can attest is one of the premier uh, urogynecological um, practices um, in the country. Um, we've had the pleasure of working with Andrea now for a couple of years. Uh, she, is, she was actually an, a member of our inaugural uh, uh, group of individuals from an APP perspective that joined the Allergan Speaker Bureau uh, in 2019. Uh, and she's continued on with us uh, this year as well. So, so we're thrilled uh, to have the opportunity to work with her. She's also participated uh, with us uh, helping to train our sales team at Allergan uh, for our past two national sales meetings. So um, we're all in for a treat today as she's gonna deliver some fantastic content. Uh, this, you're actually part of the very first group uh, that is going to hear the presentation she's going to deliver today. Uh, we just trained our entire Allergan Speakers Bureau on it literally two weeks ago. Uh, we put the finding, final finishing touches on it. Uh, and so you'll be the, the first group to get to, a chance to see it. So we look forward to your feedback. Um, we, we do encourage your questions today as well. Um, please do leverage the chat feature um, at the bottom of the screen to, to ask the Q&A, excuse me, to ask your questions and we'll take those at different parts throughout the presentation. Uh, I do also have to um, acknowledge that, um, you know, this is a promotional program uh, that is being delivered um, by Allergan, and Andrea is a paid speaker consultant um, um, for Allergan. And uh, considering all of the questions um, and considering that this is a promotional program, uh, we'll make sure that all of the content that you'll be listening to and hearing today will remain consistent with the FDA-approved package insert uh, for, for Botox. Um, and as you ask your questions, um, please can keep that in mind and consider that um, as we'll be able to provide detail only to those questions that are consistent with the approved package insert for Botox. So we appreciate that uh, and look forward to, to hearing from you. Um, so with that, um, thank you again for joining us and I will turn it over to Andrea um, to take us through the presentation. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Austin. And I also just want to thank Allergan, Abby V, for this great opportunity to speak to all of you, my colleagues um, across the country. Uh, it's just a great way to be able to connect. I just wish that we were able to meet in person. I miss seeing uh, faces face to face in person. That's my thing, but I'm getting a little bit used to this. Um, but I also just wanted to um, say uh, thank you to Allergan for recognizing nurse practitioners and physician assistants as such a vital role in uh, the patient's journey with OAB. It's nice to um, have that recognition. Um, you guys are so important in this process. 
So we'll get started on um, what your role actually is in supporting uh, this the patient's journey through uh, Botox. Um, we're going to go over a, a lot of different topics. I hope that you can take away some um, really just small clinical pearls and things that can make your life a lot easier and the patient's experience uh, a more pleasurable one with uh, walking them through the, the process. But one um, super important thing that made a big difference for us was developing an OAB care team um, for the Botox journey. There's so much uh, information and so many different uh, things that need to happen along the way. And having um, each uh, individual within your practice um, be part of that care team ha makes a huge difference because it will alleviate some of the burden that is uh, there on so the information and delivering that. So figuring out how to um, identify individuals and give them leadership roles in each, each position through a care team uh, will make a huge difference. Um, clearly educating the patients about their journey um, is, is also something that uh, takes some finesse and learning how to communicate that can take a little bit of practice. So um, hopefully this will help help uh, talk, uh, help you do that. Um, introducing Botox uh, to the patient and having the patients accept it uh, is a bit of uh, finesse as well. And that's, you know, again, along the lines of kind of using the right language and delivering it in the proper way. Um, so we want to make sure that we also figure out how to give the patients a really positive experience once they've identified that they're going to go through with it. Um, it's important for their uh, process to be something that they're comfortable with from start to finish, uh, as well as just kind of demystifying some of the misconceptions, understanding uh, what the cost is for the patient. Um, so we're going to touch on all of those things right now. But we have to get through this uh, First slide, which is basically um, going through what the indication for Botox is. We, I think we all know, um, obviously Botox has been approved for the treatment of overactive bladder, uh, which is for symptoms of urgency, frequency, urge, uh, urge incontinence uh, with patients who've had an either inadequate response or are not tolerant of anticholinergic medication. So it's been FDA approved since 2013 uh, for the use in the bladder, but it's actually been around for about 30 years or so. So it's a well-studied molecule, um, but there is a boxed warning and we can kind of briefly talk about that. Um, you know, what that really um, says in, if, you've, if you've ever read that, uh, is that there, there's some distant uh, spread of the toxin that's been noted. Um, what, what we've seen with that is that that's mostly reported in um, patients' children uh, and who've been treated with cervical, for dystonia and for spasticity. That's typically uh, where those, uh, that information is being generated from. But what's more important is just to know what the contraindications are for using Botox. Uh, there really are just uh, two uh, important ones and that's just not, uh, Botox is contraindicated in the presence of a urinary tract infection. Um, even with patients uh, just with a positive urine culture who are not necessarily symptomatic. Or it's also contraindicated in patients who have retention and are unable to uh, intermittently self-catheterize. Those are really the only two uh, major contraindications. So, you know, Botox has been well established as uh, having a pivotal role in treating the overactive uh, bladder patient. And we as professionals, uh, we follow guidelines and um, it's reassuring to know that um, AUGS, uh, ACOG, SUFU, uh, all of these different establishments have uh, supported uh, and used Botox as a standard treatment uh, with post you know, medication failure. Um, and if we uh, look through those, it's important to become familiar with the different guidelines that are placed by each of these organizations, but they all define Botox basically as an important, uh, important position and role in, in um, the OAB uh, treatment pathway. So the Botox journey can um, 
really benefit uh, a patient uh, with, who has OAB, but there can be many challenges. And I'm sure that all of you have experienced them uh, along the way. Um, identifying patients uh, and figuring out uh, how do we get those patients who've been on multiple medications, um, getting the information that they need, you know, counseling the patient and explaining to them uh, why Botox is a good option for them, just using the right words and figuring out how to deliver the message, uh, steering clear of certain buzzwords that are buzz kills for the patient, um, like self-catheterization or needles injecting, things like that. And then just the challenge of once they've maybe experienced uh, a positive effect with Botox, um, making sure that they understand that this is a chronic condition and that it will require um, retreatment and coming up with good protocols to um, establish within your practice uh, on how to have best practices going forward with patients who are getting retreatment with Botox. Um, that can be um, a large obstacle uh, for compliance, and we can lose a lot of patients if we don't have good systems in place to uh, address that. So the importance of the OAB care team, this, this really has been, um, for, for me, um, a huge a huge thing that made a big difference uh, when we started to address how uh, is this experience from start to finish for the patient. patient. Um, once you look at each of you come from different practices, you're either part of a hospital, a clinic, private practice. Um, so it's going to look different for all of you. But I think it's important when you think about um, the treatment plan for a patient who has OAB and figuring out how to provide Botox as an option that we identify all the different people within your office staff and figure out what roles or uh, things that they could excel at within the, the puzzle. Um, because we have to identify the patients, we have to deliver the message to the patient, we have to educate them, someone has to explain what the cost is. That's a lot of information. Um, and that can be incredibly time consuming. So figuring out ways to um, give your practice uh, different roles to, um, to, to take will, will kind of decrease the burden overall and make for a more efficient uh, process. So you know, clearly the experience from making sure that there's a clear, concise message that's being delivered to the patient. Um, and that means that from the moment that they walk in the door uh, from check-in to uh, the nurse or MA who may be taking them into the uh, back into the room and, and giving them patient materials and educating to the provider who's taking care of them, the MP or the PA who's educating them and, and discussing the condition to the physician who is also doing the same or, or in, uh, potentially doing their procedures. Um, each one of these roles is incredibly important um, and, and really can't exist well without the other. So making sure that you sit together periodically with your care team and talk through what that is, looks like for a patient um, is really vital. Um, and making sure that we sort of deliver a very clear, concise message um, to the patients so that there's consistency is reassuring for them. So in order to define the overactive bladder treatment journey and assessing you know, if your patient's ready for it, we need to kind of think about a few things. Um, you know, the, we, we all know that uh, we can make the diagnosis, a patient who comes in who has you know, symptoms of, of urgency, frequency, um, overactivity, incontinence, we use bladder diaries uh, as kind of your ticket to the show, so to speak, and, and that's really helpful uh, to keeping patients um, connected to their treatment plan and, and also just using that as a guideline to where if, are we meeting our goals and expectations. We all know that sort of the first line things, diet, behavior, uh, lifestyle, uh, behavior modification, pelvic floor exercises are kind of our first line uh, treatments. 
Typically, we're starting a patient on a medication by their first visit, uh, and that we bring them back in one uh, anywhere from four to six weeks to reassess. So the important um, information about this is that we want to continue to keep in mind that at every step of the way, every touch point is an opportunity to kind of reassess where we are with uh, the patient's goals and, and, and are we meeting you know, those, those expectations and getting success as we define it for the patient. So it's an opportunity to kind of set that out um, ahead of time, but typically also using um, the AUA or SUFU guidelines is something that I typically do with my patients at their very first visit and giving them a uh, either tear off sheet that helps them to kind of see what their journey might look like with that first tier being behavior, you know, set, talking about medications and then potentially if we're not getting that success in uh, their, by their next visit, uh, making sure they're aware of what those uh, next steps, third line therapies may be, uh, including obviously Botox and neuromodulation and PTNS. So this slide kind of was depressing when I saw it, but it's so true. <laughs> OAB patients often fail medications, but continue receiving them. And 71% of patients um, have a failure within the first six months. So those aren't great numbers, but what's even more depressing is that we as clinicians somehow um, are continuing just to cycle patients on, on these medications. Um, so I think it's really important that when we think about uh, the patient, we need to understand what treatment failure looks like. Um, it can be for a number of reasons, but the common ones obviously are the patient can't tolerate the medications. Um, you know, there's a number of side effects associated with uh, the anticholinergics, dry mouth, constipation. Uh, we have to be conscious of, of high blood pressure uh, with the beta threes, but uh, even more so now the safety concern with the cognitive impact that uh, anticholinergics have uh, on with the associated uh, it, uh, impact on dementia and Alzheimer's. So that's a lot uh, to just review in that of itself at the visit, making sure that we're you know, having a patient who's tolerating it. But the lack of response um, is really important to kind of set out each visit. Uh, the, it may be that we have an improvement to symptoms and they may have a reduction in their number of voids or even number of uh, episodes of incontinence, but that might not necessarily make a difference on their uh, them achieving their goals or their quality of life measures. So, um, you know, failure can, we can't really define failure until we know what their goals and success looks like for them. So I like to set uh, that out at early on uh, when they're coming in and we're talking through what uh, th how this is impacting them and what, are, what do we want to get out of this. Um, so just to review again, this, this actually made a huge difference that uh, the information that's come out uh, since I think AUGS put out their uh, guidelines on um, anticholinergics uh, with overactive bladder patients. This quite honestly was a game changer uh, for our practice and in some ways made things so much easier for, for me and for everyone else uh, because it takes some of the burden away from um, feeling uh, that we had to sort of offer uh, more medications to patients. Uh, now with the risk of, uh, you know, again, the cognitive impairment, the dementia, Alzheimer's, all associated with anticholinergics, we're trying to either get patients who are on uh, an anticholinergic off of it, even if they're having success based on some of these risks, or I don't necessarily offer them to patients unless it's something that we are obligated to do because of uh, insurances that this is the only medication that may be covered. Um, so this has kind of helped streamline the uh, process in, in not having as many options um, to offer the patients. Um, and so that's made a big difference. So I, I, I I think it's important to think how that may impact your patients and making sure that if they're on, on an anticholinergic that you're revisiting uh, that new data, which I'm sure all of you already are. 
Um, so this, I was actually quite surprised by this slide uh, when I first saw, saw it um, and by the, um, this is a, a web survey that was conducted in the UK on patients who had overactive bladder and were on a medication that 80% of patients um, were willing to try a procedure. Uh, that surprised me. I didn't realize uh, when I thought about that, I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't necessarily feel like that many patients were as willing, but um, you know, in the polls, the patients want, uh, they want success and I don't think they're getting it from their medications. So it, it's, it's something that we need to be mindful of. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of misconceptions. And, and one of those for me was that we used to a while back, um, think that we needed to have multiple medications failure before they would even qualify for Botox. Um, that was the case in our area years ago. A lot of the insurances may have required a patient to fail two, three medications that's changed. Um, most insurers do not require um, anything more than a failure with one anticholinergic before they would improve, uh, approve Botox. Um, so it's important for you uh, all to uh, have a good understanding of what the demographic is in your area uh, as far as the insurances and get a, a sense as to what uh, obstacles you may run into with, with that. But when I started to dig a little bit deeper on this information, I realized that, that uh, we were able to get uh, insurances to cover this um, much more easily with just uh, one medication failure. And that, that helps uh, not delay the patient's care uh, from a timing perspective. So getting specific to assess the true impact of OAB. I feel like this is where you um, as advanced practitioners excel. Um, we take pride in getting to know our patients and personally developing relationships with them. And I know myself, I love to educate uh, them on their conditions and their options being an educator. So we just need to sometimes think about you know, digging just a little bit deeper with the, the right questions to get the patients to open up. Um, if you ask the right questions and you listen carefully, you'll realize that um, the patients are suffering and they want desperately to um, have an improvement to their quality of life. And so many times, um, you know, we may have patients every 15 minutes, you know, and you don't necessarily have that time built in. But if you kind of carve out some very specific questions that you like to ask your overactive bladder patients just to really have them open up about how it's impacting them, um, as well as just getting them to realize that it's a con it's it's a valid reason to go forward with treatments. You know, this is something that can have an impact on their sleep, which can cause depression. Um, they may be isolated. Uh, feel it impacts their relationships, their travel time, um, so many aspects of their life. So it's really important to keep that in mind. And it's a privilege to take care of these patients. We need to understand, you know, uh, how the condition is actually affecting them. So that just takes uh, communication. And I know that you guys slam this one out of the park, I'm sure. But uh, so it's a, you know, it's a good time to pause and think, you know, about how you can uh, identify the patients in your practice and the way that you go about educating them and the specific questions you may ask to see if they are really ready to go forward. Uh, patient identification is, is key um, in, in kind of getting them moving forward with it. So... Now we're gonna talk about Botox and uh, the clinical profile. So we're gonna talk data. Um, this, when an anticholinergic fails, uh, we wanna kind of be able to start talking about the next uh, third line options, Botox being one of them. This slide is, uh, the important parts about this slide, I think that are the take home messages are that 
by two weeks, we see about a 50% reduction in daily leakage episodes. And that's significant. Um, you know, there are, as we know, medications take four to six weeks uh, to even start to work sometimes. Uh, a lot of the therapies, we are not able to get this fast of a response. Um, and this particular study, we had uh, patients that had a mean baseline of urge incontinence episodes uh, of up to five a day. So they were you know, significant in, in their uh, nature of what this condition was. Um, and I think this is kind of the take home message when you're delivering it to the patients and they say, well, is it going to work? Um, you can confidently say that they're, they're going to have at, you know, at least a 50% reduction, but quite honestly, in, a, in many other patients, they have a reduction in symptoms and in about 25% of patients, they may be dry. <clears throat> This next slide um, is interesting. So if you know um, much about placebo, I, I thought this was interesting that, you know, many of the things that we offer patients, um, whether it's diet, behavior modification, even medications, they're as good as a placebo effect. Um, this slide shows us that Botox is, is at least three times better than, than placebos. And that, that's a, that makes a difference when we're in the, talking in the world of overactive bladder. Um, and this was meaningful because what this particularly, you know, talking about those quality of life measures is for me something that is one of the most validating things in, in, in giving this treatment, um, you know, uh, be putting this treatment in the forefront for patients. Um, they, they looked at uh, psychosocial impact, the social embarrassment, avoiding, you know, avoidance of physical activity and things like that. And uh, this obviously shows, you know, just the threshold for clinically meaningful differences is quite low. Um, so that's based on kind of what the FDA's um, uh, guidelines were. So this is far exceeds that. Um, it's important to know what the safety profile is for um, Botox. And uh, the two, two main areas that we need to educate and explain to patients are understanding that there is a an increase in urinary tract infections in about 18% of patients. That definition uh, based on the clinical trials was defined as a positive urine culture, uh, not necessarily based on symptoms. And uh, as well as then urinary retention. So urinary retention in this clinical trial uh, was basically um, not defined as a the inability to completely empty, but it was uh, an arbitrary uh, number with uh, using PVR thresholds of, of 200 or, or greater. So that's uh, six, you know, six percent of patients will experience some um, type of retention and that can look different for, for many of them. Another important thing to know is that in an extended trial, um, the open label three-year extension trial, there was no change in the overall um, uh, safety profile with Botox retreatment. So a lot of patients wind up asking, you know, will I become immune to this if I keep uh, using it? And you can reassure them that uh, there's been no change in its uh, safety profile as well as its impact on symptoms going forward. So introducing Botox uh, to foster treatment acceptance. So this, this is really about kind of the finesse in how we deliver the message. Um, so, you know, I think this will help guide your conversations um, I, I actually learned quite a bit from my training through Allergan on how to communicate information effectively, maybe some life lessons even. Um, you know, how we, what we say and how we say matters. Uh, so when we start to think about um, what the patients are actually hearing, 
we realize that we need to make sure that we're presenting the information in a way that they can they can accept it and and be open minded to what it is. So a lot of times uh, we think patients are not interested in Botox because they have a misperception about it, but uh, we know that the way that we say it and how we say it will make all the difference for your patient. Um, you as their provider, if you make a clear and concise uh, recommendation with confidence, they're going to follow your lead. So it's in, really important to get comfortable kind of with this um, process and it takes practice uh, and it takes some time to, and, and it takes experience in, in doing it. So you need to sort of test it out. But um, this ease, the eff efficacy, administration, safety, and expense, sort of keeping it in that model will, will help guide you um, with the conversation. Um, because I think, you know, one is identifying the patients, but once we've done that, it's getting the information to them so that they can actually understand it in a clear and concise way. So we start off with um, you know, efficacy. And I think you know, the last couple slides back, we'll kind of touch on those points that we wanna start off uh, the patients in explaining how much of an impact this is going to have on their quality of life measures. So if we say to them, Botox cuts leakage episodes in half, um, and will have a positive impact on your quality of life, you know, by the 12 week mark, um, that's significant. Uh, we always wanna make sure that we're setting kind of realistic expectations uh, for the patients with, uh, with their goals and that they understand that this is a chronic condition um, and that will require uh, continued treatment. So there is uh, important for them to know that they need to be um, retreated. So the next step is kind of, okay, what is that going to look like? What is uh, the administration of Botox uh, going to look like for the patient? So this is super important. Um, this is where you need to spend time yourself on delivering the message to the patient uh, and get comfortable uh, with saying it. So we, you know, we wanna make sure that we stay away uh, and avoid certain trigger words that might scare patients away. Uh, so we start, you know, definitely with, we place Botox in your bladder during the procedure uh, done here in our office uh, and we make you as comfortable as possible. I think one of the selling points for me, for a lot of my patients who are busy working moms, um, to be able to say that you can come in on your lunch hour and you know be in and out of the office in less than an hour uh, with no downtime uh, is is a really huge selling piece for so many patients. Um, so I think it's important to kind of make sure that they understand that this is something that we can do uh, in a very easy and safe way right in the office that doesn't take a lot of time. Um, and again, just touching on the point that, uh, it, it, you know, patients will have success and then they'll forget that this does wear off. Um, so they'll say, oh my gosh, it just stopped working or, you know, they'll forget. So it's just important to kind of continue to re-educate uh, them that this is typically, it lasts, you know, on average about six months. So we do have the patient schedule uh, their repeat Botox at the same time of their procedure in six months so that we kind of keep them on track and we don't lose patients. Um, of course, we want to always touch on the safety aspect of, of things and start with the positive. Um, you know, this is where we also lose patients if we, you know, the, of course, when we think about having to self catheterize, that's the, that's where we lose most of our patients. So we want to deliver the message in a way that we are explaining to them 94 out of 100 patients who are using Botox um, do not need to self-catheterize. So if it does happen to you, it's only temporary. Um, and we're here for you. We're gonna walk you through what that's going to look like and we're gonna figure it out. 
Um, so a lot of times when, when I find a patient who said, who I, I start to talk about Botox and before I get anywhere, they say, oh, no, I don't want to do that. That's, you know, yeah, I don't want to catheterize myself. I, I say, okay, well, let's talk about that. Um, you know, first of all, let me put this in perspective. Um, these are the numbers. The numbers are that, you know, 94% of patients uh, do not need to catheterize. So yes, there is a risk of that, but it's low. Um, you know, they also are scared from this idea of retention. They don't know what that means. So uh, retention, you know, can look a lot of different ways, but most of the time, all that means is that you may have some difficulty in emptying your bladder. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't empty. It just may be a little bit more difficult in you emptying fully. And to remind them that that is temporary. Um, it's going to be a challenge and it may be a little bit of an obstacle, but it won't last for that long. Um, and then of course, uh, just explaining to them about the catheter. If we are able to get to that point and talking to them about what, um, you know, what does that look like? What if I have to use a catheter? Is that, what, what does that mean? So um, it's really helpful sometimes. I, I may have a patient that I said, do you think it would help you if I showed you what that looks like? Um, you know, if, if you're one of those people who wants to know all the details, we can even have you come in and I can walk you through worst case scenario, if you are that patient and you're not able to, uh, and you, you have retention where you can't empty your bladder, um, let me show you what that's gonna look like. I'm confident that we can uh, figure it out together. Um, and that just reassures the patient. So it takes away a lot of those kind of mysteries and misconceptions about uh, what they might be thinking. Um, the expense piece of things, that's a, a, also a, a mis misperception. And even on my part, I, I don't think I understood this very well until fairly recently even, um, that for Medicare covers Botox, uh, almost, you know, in where we are, it's 100% coverage um, or very little or out of pocket uh, cost for the patients. So cost is really important in my area. I mean, that drives a lot of our decisions for the patients. So I may have patients who are doing well on a medication, but the medicine's so expensive that I say, hey, we might wanna just, re let's revisit um, kind of what that's costing you and take a look at um, Botox may be a cheaper option for you. Um, and most commercial uh, insurance plans cover Botox. Uh, they may pay zero or very little out of, um, out of pocket, but there's a fantastic Botox savings program that if you are not aware of it, it is really important to designate someone in your office uh, to become savvy with it and be able to deliver that information uh, to the patient. So that's again, where our nurse navigator is huge in um, helping kind of the patients along with what the cost looks like. Uh, and checking their eligibility and making sure that we're getting the prior authorization appropriately. Um, so uh, I, I urge all of you to go back to your practice and to ask the right questions to the people who know uh, whether it's in billing or if you're, you know, the nurses navigator in our practice. What insurance is, what's our majority of insurance in our area? Uh, what is the coverage like? Um, and, you know, how, how much of an obstacle is this from a financial standpoint and how can we help uh, get that information to the patient so that they can understand what the cost really is? Because I, 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 I believe that if you um, find out, you'll find that it's actually quite cost effective. So counseling the patient, um, you know, this is a good, what would you do? This may be a, a good opportunity to uh, pause for a moment if there are any questions. Um, Austin, I'll, I'll defer to you if there's anyone who has any questions at this point that we may want to answer.
Sorry, Andrea, I was getting myself off mute there really quickly. Um, <laughs> thanks for pausing <laughs> as we all navigate through the technology here. Yeah, we've gotten a few questions um, and, and I'll, I'll sort of take, there's a couple of that have come up that are sort of insurance related. So I'll, mm-hmm. I'll um, answer those and then you can add your, your color commentary too based on your experience. Uh, so one of the questions was, um, will Medicare cover it more than once per year? Um, the answer is yes, Medicare will cover it uh, more than once per year. Um, there is no prior authorization required for Medicare Part B covered patients. And uh, they will essentially cover it um, no sooner than 12 weeks. So the, the, the treatment sort of cycle that Andrea will be speaking to a little better uh, is typically about every six months. Um, but, but as per the package insert, uh, it can be administered no sooner than 12 weeks. So they will essentially cover it um, up to four times per year. Um, so, so that sort of answers that question. And then the other question that came up earlier that I wanted to acknowledge and then also get your experience on, um, Andrea, um, was around um, mere metric failure. So does insurance, um, you know, are, do we see limitations um, on Botox use requiring you to step through mere metric? Um, and so that's a very good question. And, and we've done a very extensive analysis and we've found that only 4% of commercially Medicare and Medicaid covered lives actually require you to step through mere metric before Botox can be approved. So the lion's share of plans do not require you to step at it through mere metric uh, before you would use uh, Botox. So hopefully that provides a little um, insight. But Andrea, um, from your perspective, have you seen um, anything in your area, you know, specifically to mere metric um, requirements for Botox? Not specifically the mirror bet trick. I, I mean, I, I do have a, a number of patients that plans that require them just to have, have failed a medication. Um, but not, you know, clearly even with uh, Medicare, that's not the case. I mean, that's, we, we can even go to, to that um, straight away for many of those patients. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds, you know, consistent with what we found. We just, there's not a lot of step at it. Um, and it's very surprising, as you pointed out earlier, uh, a, a large percentage of the plans do not require you to fail multiple anticholinergics um, before going to Botox. So that's what we sort of found. And it um, sounds like that's consistent with, with what you've seen in your practice. So um, there are a couple more questions coming in, but um, I think we'll just go ahead and move forward, Andrea, and we'll take more questions um, towards the end of the presentation. Okay, great. Um, so once we've identified the patient and we've um, convinced them that Botox is the right option for them, uh, providing a positive experience for them in the office, which is predominantly where we we do all of our procedures for Botox. Very rarely do we do them at the hospital. 99% of the time we're, we're doing them in office. Um, it's really important to provide a good experience for the patient. Um, I think again, you know, making sure that they they realize when they come in, this is just a, you know, this is an office procedure. The actual time it takes to, to de- deliver the Botox into the bladder is, is short and quick. You know, start to finish, they'll be out in, in less than an hour. Uh, we're just using a, a, some local anesthesia. Um, a lot of times we have uh, amazing nurses and uh, MAs who help us with that verbal anesthesia. Uh, which, you know, is just kind of distracting the patient sometimes, talking to them throughout the procedure, maybe providing some comfortable music um, and um, just, you know, making sure that they uh, have a positive, comfortable experience. That's so important. We don't want them to finally get to that point and then um, have a really negative experience, even if they have good results from the medication or from, from the Botox, uh, it's unfortunate if they felt as though they were uh, in pain or they had to be there for a really long time or they just were nervous and scared the whole time. So you need to kind of think through what those steps look like uh, in, your pra- in your practice. Um, and that, that kind of goes back to a little bit of that care pathway that we were, uh, care team that we were talking about. 
um, you know, providing a good experience for uh, the patient is, is something that requires uh, multiple steps, multiple people within your practice for that to be a really um, seamless, you know, seem as a seamless effort, um, making sure the patients have the correct expectations, of course, before we get started obviously making sure that your equipment and everything that you have is, is appropriate and in place. Um, that comfort level, uh, you know, sometimes I, I like to ask the patients even ahead of time before we even do that, what do you typically, like? what would make you feel comfortable during this? Is, would you like music? Do you like us to talk? Do you want us to not say anything? You know, just understanding kind of your patient and what works for them is really important. Um, so, uh, that, that's something that we want to make sure that there's protocols in place uh, for that. Establishing retreatment protocol um, to keep patients uh, on track. This is really valuable. Um, we found in the, you know, when we were really starting to do more and more Botox in our practice, we, we did not have uh, good systems in place to figure out like, when do we bring them back? How do we get them rescheduled? There was a lot of uh, loss to follow up um, because we were not, uh, we did not have a good system in place. Uh, so what we discovered was at the time that the patients finished with their treatment and they're, they're checking out, um, we typically make two appointments for them. One will be a, a quick two week uh, follow up just to make sure that uh, we're checking PVRs and check in on them um, symptom wise and checking for retention. And then we actually schedule their repeat Botox. And we've used the six month interval as our uh, retreatment interval, and that seems to work. Um, you know, in light of telehealth, uh, I find that there's this kind of four month window post Botox that is a really nice touch point. Uh, if we don't have to bring the patient in the office and we can actually just reach out to them uh, via telehealth just to touch in and talk, talk to them, it's a really nice way to stay, have them stay engaged and connected in their care, uh, as well as just identify some patients there may be, you know, symptoms are returning and we wouldn't want them to have to uh, have symptoms return, wait for the six months, we want to get them in sooner. So um, establishing in your practice kind of good uh, retreatment protocols is extremely important and works for you, but um, it will make all the difference for sure. Um, so again, this, this is just kind of uh, going, harping on that six month uh, interval, but that, that does seem to be a really magic number in, in what we're seeing. Uh, six months is the median time for retreatment for, for Botox in the clinical studies. Um, so again, um, making sure that we're pre-scheduling the retreatment um, on the day of the injection, I think, saves a lot of um, staff time and headaches uh, in, in getting this uh, as a seamless um, event. So Botox, um, other than there's uh, different ways that you can do this. There's a, we, we have a really nice portal uh, through our practice that we're able to send uh, patients text messages. Um, and those are really fantastic reminders uh, to um, patients who have had Botox just to say, hey, you may be due for your upcoming uh, revisit, retreatment, just ways to check in. So that may be, again, another great point just to figure out uh, what, what resources you have available uh, to make sure that patients stay connected uh, for their retreatments and how um, we don't lose them for, to follow up. Um, helping the patients understand the Botox cost and coverage um, I, I, again, I can't say this enough. Uh, if I didn't have my, my nurse navigator uh, to help with uh, some of that information, it's, it would be um, really time consuming. So it's really nice to be able to identify people in the practice and give them sort of those, those leadership roles. Um, but cost uh, for the patient um, 
maybe a big concern and I'm sure it is for for many of your patients um, so that usually drives a lot of our decisions and in, in what we're going to offer for the patient or what recommendations that we make um, so making sure that we're being proactive when we're identifying Botox as them that we say okay we're going to get prior authorization we're going we'll help you understand you know what this is going to look like for you from a cost perspective um, and <clears throat> and most of the time uh, we find that, you know, with the Botox savings program, that's been uh, incredibly helpful uh, and it's minimized cost to the patient significantly. Um, again, we did touch on this, but basically for uh, coverage for Medicare patients is 100%. Um, and so that's really reassuring, especially in my practice, we have large percentage of patients that are Medicare. So it just makes for the conversation once we've identified that they're a candidate, uh, that's their next question. And I said, that's usually never an issue. Um, clearly we're gonna make sure that that's, you know, we'll find out what the cost will be to you, but most of the time cost is not an issue at all. Um, and it, even with the commercial insurance plans, it's covered, uh, you know, almost 99%. Um, but the Botox savings programs, if you don't know about it, I would urge you to uh, look into it uh, because they can provide your patients great savings, uh, um, paying as little as zero dollars out of pocket for, for, for Botox treatments. So um, you can ask your reps and they can help you with some of that information. So I think that's about it. Let's see. So let's see, ways you can help your patients on the Botox journey. So I think we've kind of gone over all of those uh, slides, but um, most important, you know, identifying what your role is in the practice uh, and responsibility as part of the OAB care team. Um, you as nurse practitioners and PAs, you are so vital to this care team. Um, and you are really, in my mind, are one of the important pieces of the puzzle in, in getting patient success. Um, making sure you outline what that journey looks like for the patients um, in as far as <clears throat> establishing what your um, your goals are for the patient at their very first visit and making sure that you revisit that every time that they come back uh, for their follow-ups. Um, that will really help you to assess, you know, how is our therapy doing? Uh, are, we, are we getting and reaching our goals so that we are really making those quality of life differences for the patient? Uh, I think if we use those models, they'll, you will see that there's a, a greater read, readiness to move on to, to Botox. Don't forget to use that ease model. Um, ease will really help uh, when we're kind of having to talk through the information and using your words wisely, um, knowing sort of what to say and how to say it is, is really important. Um, as well as just coming up with those protocols within your practice to know um, what typically um, uh, wh what typically we need to do for uh, re revisiting um, it as a every six month uh, treatment. Um, questions. You know what? I I'm sorry. I kind of skipped over these, uh, but let me just. <clears throat> briefly, I think we kind of talked about them, but just want to make sure that I'm, I'm you know, not, not misleading things. But uh, uh, for safety information about Botox, uh, clearly um, we've, we went through the war warnings and precautions. Um, there's increased risks uh, associated with patients who have pre-existing conditions. You always want to make sure that we're screening our patients um, beforehand for Botox. Uh, anyone who has uh, any neuromuscular conditions, um, ALS, MS, uh, those are patients that are going to be at a much uh, higher risk uh, with this. And I usually caution we uh, are avoiding um, you know, Botox in these patients. Uh, clearly, someone who has chronic urinary tract infections, um, usually you know, two uh, or more urinary tract infections within six months, I work with those patients. They're not, uh, we wanna make sure that we, we address the urinary tract uh, infections 
prior to Botox and we come up with certain protocols to have them infection free. Uh, that will make a big impact on their uh, success with Botox, but I don't recommend Botox on someone who has chronic infections because uh, this will typically, they won't get the same type of, uh, of results. Um, and then again, um, clearly we, as we talked about in the beginning, um, you know, it is contraindication in contraindicated in patients who have retention uh, and are, are unable to uh, intermittently uh, self-cath. Uh, so it's in important to kind of keep those safety uh, in information in, in your mind um, before we, we actually uh, recommend Botox to your patients. Um, <clears throat> Urinary retention in patients treated with uh, bladder for overactive trials. I think we kind of touched on this before. Um, another important thing to know is that uh, for some of your patients, this product uh, does con contain albumin, um, which is a derivative of human blood. So uh, you want to you know, make sure that if there are any of your patients in the practice who this may be a uh, concern for, um, it's, there's just you know, a very theoretical risk of transmission within those patients, but um, it's extremely remote, but it is something that is just important to note. Um, let's see. Another uh, thing to know too is just drug interactions. Uh, Co-administration of Botox uh, is, is something that we need to be um, really cautious about with patients who are on uh, immunoglycosides. Um, we, we want to um, proceed with caution uh, to the effect that the toxin may be potentiating those effects. So an even use of anticholinergic medications after Botox uh, may exacerbate or potentiate uh, anticholinergic uh, effects um, with Botox. So being cautious in those patient population. Well, I'm super thankful that I had the opportunity to speak with all of you. Thank you. I would love to hear any questions that uh, you all have. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Um, fantastic presentation. Um, and, and I think one of the things that you said that really resonated with me is that, you know, there are certain buzzwords that could be a buzzkill for patients. And as you mentioned, you know, we've learned a lot over the years that, you know, the, the words you use and the order in which you introduce Botox really matters. So, um, you know, we encourage you to really think about that talk track, um, you know, similar to what Andrea does in her practice to optimize um, the patient comfort with Botox as you introduce it to them and maximize the probability you'll get a yes when you do. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and take the next few minutes just to go through a few questions. There's a couple quick ones that I think we can hit on. Um, so one of them was, is there a minimum age restriction for Botox injections? And I can go ahead and take that one. As per the FDA approved product label, um, we, we, we included patients that were 18 and older. So most um, insurance companies and payers are consistent with the product label, um, which would be 18 and above approved for Botox injections for overactive bladder. Um, another one that I wanted to get your take on, Andrea, I'll, I'll add a little bit to as well. Um, I'd be interested to know if pre most practices are performing urodynamics prior to administering Botox or if some find an acceptable PBR is enough. So I can tell you that as part of the registration trials for overactive bladder, um, doing prior urodynamics was not part of the protocol. And um, per our understanding, most insurance companies for overactive bladder do not require urodynamics prior to approving Botox. Um, whether that's you know, a common practice amongst um, different practices, um, I'll defer to you, Andrea, and based on you know, kind of what you guys do in your practice and your understanding, um, if that is a common practice. Right, so we do not require our patients to do urodynamics prior to Botox. Um, and even for the diagnosis of overactive bladder, or mixed urinary incontinence. Um, the only time that I would see you maybe recommend doing a urodynamics prior to uh, Botox is if I have somebody that they have a mixed picture of incontinence. It's not 
necessarily clear if that's their predominant issue is because of incontinence and we're not 100% clear that it is uh, an intrinsic issue and it that may be a structural component going on like intrinsic sphincter deficiency. I may want to um, do urodynamics uh, prior to Botox, but that's not protocol. We rarely, uh, we don't make patients do that ahead of time. It's it's a, just for a, a, a few patients. If we're also not clear on uh, someone who has retention uh, and understanding sort of what their detrusor um, activity is like, we, we may do a urodynamics procedure, but that's not standard and, and that's not common that we do that. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. Um, one other quick one. I want to make sure I touch on this just to ensure that we're, we're clear. So we talked a lot about, you know, insurance and what insurance requires and sort of demystifying, you know, when they'll allow you to use Botox per um, the payer requirement. And so a question came in, just want to make sure I got this right. Does it mean that Botox can be added to the bladder care pathway as the first line management with conservative therapy? So what I can say is that we align to the AUA SUFU guidelines, as well as the AUGS ACOG guidelines that Andrea mentioned earlier in the presentation. And so those generally recommend first line management being conservative therapies, including behavioral management um, and dietary um, restrictions. Second line would be oral medications. Um, and then third line would be um, the advanced therapies such as Botox. So that's what we uh, recommend in terms of the bladder care pathway. Um, I think that it's important to note um, in the second line management, as Andrea spoke to, you do not have to step through multiple medications before you can use Botox. That's consistent with the AUA and SUFU guidelines, and that's consistent with what the majority of the insurance companies um, will allow you to do um, before approving Botox. So I want to make sure that we're clear on that. And Andrea, I don't know if you have you know, anything you would add based on, you know, how you fit Botox into the bladder care pathway in your own practice. So you, you laid it out uh, well, Austin. Um, yes, we, we usually follow those guidelines. We have that care pathway that, that typically looks like those first line, just as you described, you know, diet, behavior, uh, physical therapy, um, second line being typically uh, using medications and showing them third line. I do, I, but I do like to show them that, that pathway on their first visit so they understand where they are uh, in, in the journey, so to speak, and kind of what to potentially expect if, some, if, if we don't get success with uh, some therapies, what, what our options are. Um, but typically after I have a patient um, who has a failure of a medication, it, you know, I, I, for sure it's, it's going to be in that conversation uh, as, as the next step. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and we've, we've actually found as well, to your point, that introducing that entire care pathway um, on the first visit and every visit sort of gives the patient uh, hope gives them understand of what's to come uh, if the, the management uh, point that they're at currently um, doesn't work well for them. So, so agree with that. Well, I know that we're uh, a couple of minutes over, so I want to be respectful of the time for AUGS and, and thank all of you for um, joining us today. And thank you, Andrea, for taking us through uh, all the content and providing your expertise. Uh, for, for any of you that do have additional questions, we do have a section, a sponsorship sponsorship section within the AUGS, um, the, the website for this meeting. And there is an email address in there where you can go in and, and submit any additional questions you have. So sorry to, for those of you that we weren't able to get to all your questions, but you can feel free to ask questions through that feature. There are also resources available uh, in there as well. So, so thank you to all of you for joining us today. Have a great rest of the meeting and we look forward to meeting with you again. Funmi, I will turn it back over to you. Bye all, thank you.